Chapter 1281 The Real Show What you saw previously was just me stretching out, Dahl said. Okay then, skip the opening acts and get on with the real show, Hansen said, looking at Dahl. If summoning and riding a dragon was just flexing her muscles, then how strong must the spirit have been? Can it summon a flock of dragons, maybe? Hansen tried guessing what was about to occur. When the doll moved into the performance that it wished to show off, Hansen was amazed. The doll swung its hand and sliced the dragon's head clean off. Hansen had seen many chefs in action before, but he had never seen one make the effort to cook a dragon. Her hands were like the finest blades, and they skirted, shaved, and slit the body of the dragon with mesmerizing precision. In a flash, the creature had been gutted. Then, the meat was thrown onto sizzle and cook. The doll summoned a frying pan out of thin air to cook the meat. This was something else that surprised Hans Sr. Hansen now knew why there were so many bones scattered across the underground shelter, as well. The master of the shelter must have adored food and been an avid diner of creatures. It was no wonder other creatures did not dare come close. When the chef brought the dish out to Hansen, he snapped out of his shock rot days. Can I really eat this? Hansen asked. The frightening dragon that had been summoned from a black vortex was now food. Hansen struggled with the concept of it being something he could actually eat. Oh, yes. You can eat it, Dahl said. Hansen took in a good whiff, and he noted how the finely cooked meat reminded him of his experience in the restaurant named Doria. The marvelous ingredients that composed the meal he had just been given could not easily be found in the Alliance, if at all. Hansen put some of the meat in his mouth, and he was given a shock. The meat was incredibly juicy and succulent, and the sauce that glazed his mouth delivered his taste buds a substance that was nothing short of ecstasy-inducing. A second later, after the pause that was brought on by the surprise, Hansen resumed eating the meat with a ravenous appetite. Bauer leapt into Hansen's arms after that. She wanted some too, and she made sure to grab a big and juicy piece of meat that hung from a bone. Ah, Bauer was an equal delight. She scoffed down the meat and spat out the bone. Her jaw operated like a machine as she mowed through all the meat she could. Hansen's eyes were actually tearing up, having never tasted something so delicious. Hansen ate as much as he could, and as soon as he was done with one portion of meat, Dahl delivered another. Eventually, he was too stuffed to go on. But somehow, Bauer was able to eat more than him, and she went on for a while after. Hansen felt as if his stomach was going to explode if he went on much further. And just as he lay back to revel in the wistful memory of that meal, he heard an announcement play. Self-geno point plus one. Hansen was surprised, not expecting the meal to give him a self-geno point. During his stint in the Valley of Time, Hansen had consumed a lot of fruit. He had achieved a staggering 900 self-geno points and opened nine gene locks of Super King Spirit Mode in the process. But after that, there weren't any more effects. And ever since then, Hansen had not been able to claim a single self geno point extra. You could imagine the shock, realizing Dahl's food could actually provide him some. Unfortunately for him, he was too full right now. And if he went on, he wouldn't be far off eating the entire dragon. Can I keep the meat and eat it later? Hansen asked. You can keep it, but each creature can only provide one self geno point. Eating more at a later time will not provide you any more, Dahl answered. Hansen then thought of another question to ask, so he said, Can you summon another ingredient? Like, at a whim? I can summon a fresh one once a month, but the creature or ingredient is random. But keep in mind that they can also provide you with different types of geno points. Different types of geno points? Hansen frowned. Dahl had no answer to this, as she had no idea what they could be, either. After all, she could only copy others. She didn't have the knowledge to inform Hansen about things that were not inherent to her true self. Hansen was disappointed by the lengthy time frame between each meal. Still, each meal could be shared. And since there was far more than he could have hoped to eat by himself, he could share it with the rest of his companions, so they could all receive Geno points together. Hansen didn't think it would do them any harm. Before Hansen could invite the silver fox over to eat, he had already sneaked in and started munching away. So, Hansen called the rest of the people over to come and eat the meat. Thorn Queen received a self-geno point. Woo, you mad lad. My food is like dog food compared to this stuff. Xia Ching King exclaimed. Golden Growler and Meowth ate their fair share, too, while Little Angel only ate a small amount. 
Back in the Alliance, Shui Fian sent Hansen a message. She thanked him greatly for saving Shui Yuching and Shui Qin and retrieving the item they had been missing all that time. She invited Hansen over to a vacation planet owned by the Shui family. And then, they sent a ship to pick him up. It had been a long time since Hansen had taken a holiday, so he decided to take Ji Yin and and Bauer. Before he went, though, Xie Qing King gave him a comic for reading material. It was the second installment in his overbearing President Love 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 series, and he wanted Hansen to upload and distribute it on his behalf. Last time, Hansen set up an auto-release system. Once a day, a chapter would be released. He had never seen the results or what became of it. Chapter 1282 being recognized. Hansen brought Ji Yan Ran, Bauer, and Zero with him on the spacecraft to visit Auto Planet. Auto Planet was one big holiday resort, and a single ticket was all it took for a visitor to enjoy the plethora of services available there. Chasing respite, you could eat and play to your heart's content. After being given access to the planet, everything there was free. Aside from the caveat that you couldn't take anything home with you, as that would be theft. Since only the most high-class citizens could typically afford a vacation planet, tickets were very expensive. Those who went there were the sorts with fat wallets and thick purses. And for certain additional services, people were expected to open said currency holders to experience them. Hansen's ticket was all-inclusive, however. He would be able to enjoy every single service available at his own pleasure and disclosure. Nothing was off-limits for his visit. That being said, he wasn't interested in making use of any of the special services. He was happy enough with what the ordinary tickets provided. Right now, Bauer was playing with an animal that looked like an oversized, brightly capped mushroom. This, like the rest of Planet Otto's wildlife, was a tame creature. The animals that roamed the planet were mostly docile, friendly, and highly intelligent. Mushroom-like creatures were also the dominant species, able to be seen more than any other animal. They were plush, cuddly, and lacking limbs. Whether that was their reason for not being hostile was up for debate. Hansen and Ji Yin and were in the sea, enjoying the water and sunshine. Zero was spread out on the beach, gorging on a slightly concerning sway of the foods and drinks. Hansen suddenly recalled that he hadn't yet uploaded the second volume of overbearing President Love Love Love. Not wanting to disappoint his friend, no matter how eccentric he may have been, Hansen decided to depart the sea and return to the beach to sort out what he had promised Xie Qing King. He separated the chapters and set them up for automatic release at a certain time each and every day. Excuse me? As Hansen was sorting it out, a woman spoke to him in a hushed, almost trembling tone. Hansen looked up and saw two girls standing nearby. They looked to be about 18 years old, and the way they stood was almost as if they were unsure if they might be provoking a wild animal. May I help you, ladies? Hansen asked the two. As he did, he thought to himself, it sucks to be famous. Not even sunglasses can hide my hot looks. Perhaps I should get a pair for my abs, too. And in regards to having so many fans, I should really work on my signature. Are you Xie Qing King? The girls had a jittery stance, and the pitch of their voices was erratic. Xie Qing King? No. Hansen vehemently denied it. Well, we happened to see you uploading the second volume just now. But don't worry. We won't tell anyone you're him. Oh, gosh. We are your biggest fans. And the wait for a new volume has been so painful. The initial nervousness of the girls had been washed away by a sudden burst of excitement, and they now spoke to Hansen with a near rabid look in their eyes. Hansen tried telling them he wasn't Xie Qing King, but nothing he said made them believe it. They just thought he was being humble and not fond of the limelight. Bossman, your secret is ours. We pledge this to you. We won't whisper this to another soul. You can count on it, the girls said, and then they left, giggling violently to themselves. Hansen quickly opened Skynet and hurried over to the website he had released Xie Qing King's comic on. Keep going, Bossman. Don't let it end here. I'm really loving your comic. If you ever need a baby maker, I'm your gal. PM me. A lady with long legs and big boobs is seeking your love. Mr. President, Feel free to arrange a hookup so you can fondle my boobs to your heart's content. Mr. President, I've just hit 18. I suppose now I can leave you my number for some raunchy fun. You are my god. Capital G. You saved my soul. Mr. President, when is the next release? Please update the comic with a new volume. I'm dying to find out what happens next.
Still no new update? I'm jonesing for my next fix here. The comic was far more popular than Han Sin could have anticipated. Across the entire webcomic community, the comic had surged from the lowly positions of unknown authors without an established fandom to the lofty position of number two on the power rankings chart. It was quite the surprise, considering updates were so infrequent. It had been half a month since the last update, so its continued charting was something that was almost unheard of. The power rankings were a fickle thing, too. If the updates came at a steady pace, it had undoubtedly reached first place on the chart. I'm a super aristocrat. How can Xia Qin King write some ridiculous comic and achieve such widespread fame and acclaim? Hansen felt as if he had been shortchanged. Pa, quite the charmer, huh? What did you do this time to end up merrily chatting with two young girls while your wife was left to swim alone? Hansen turned around to see Ji Yan Ran, with a fire blazing in her eyes. Few things terrified Han Senator, he could stand up to emperor class spirits without fear. But before his wife's scorn, his knees were jelly and his resolve was wet salt. No, you misunderstand. You've misunderstood the misunderstanding. They were talking with who they believed to be Xie Qing King. After that, Hansen did his best to explain who Xie Qing King was. And then he proceeded to tell her about the comic. Ji Yin and had encountered spirits before, but she had never forged a friendship with one, as Hansen did with many. I thought spirits were all heinous, murdering, hall dwelling boss battle type fiends? Ji Yanren said, with a confused look. Many of them are, but Xie Qing King is special, that's for sure, Hansen said. Hansen then turned to look at Bauer, who seemed to have grown a following of her own. She was more popular than the much-adored wildlife of the resort, judging from the crowd that had gathered. Hansen then saw the group approach, with a short-haired girl carrying Bauer in her arms. I am a professional warframe operator of the Alliance. My name is Xia Yusen. Are you Bao's father? The girl was polite in her introduction and subsequent questioning. Yes. Has she been misbehaving again? Hansen asked, standing up. No, she's a delightful thing. But she did mention her father was a remarkable Warframe operator, and even went so far as to strike up a bet on your behalf. If you win, we'll deliver a shipload of candy to her from my home planet. If you lose, we are provided the opportunity to spend a few days in Bauer's company. Xie Yusin explained succinctly, not wanting a misunderstanding. Hansen looked at Bauer, who was staring back at him with pleading eyes. She clearly wanted Hansen to take the woman up on the bet. But it was clear to Hansen that all she wanted was the candy that was up for grabs. Okay, let's have a match. Hansen smiled. Chapter 1283, Ask T.S. of your. You're serious? You want to challenge me? Xie Yusin was legitimately surprised. WA was the top Warframe league across the entire alliance. Those who were eligible to compete in such a league were the best of the best, true professionals in every sense of the word. They might not have received much fame, but that was no slight to their talents. Hansen put Bauer on his shoulder and said, If Bauer made this deal, I'd be foolish to turn this down. I wouldn't want to disappoint her. A young man then stepped forward to ask Hansen, You know what the WA is, don't you? Hansen shook his head to tell them he didn't. Aside from those who were invested in the Warframe community, it was not likely people would know about each league there was. Hansen spent most of his time in the sanctuaries, so he genuinely had no clue as to what the WA was. Xie Yusin and all who followed her were given a shock. Might I ask, where did you learn to operate a Warframe? Xie Yusin nervously asked. Oh, let's see. I think it was during my time in the military school, Hansen said. Everyone was becoming breathless with their repeated gasps. The crowd that had come now looked amongst themselves, all with looks of confusion on their faces. What Hansen had just told them was basically the equivalent of learning a sport through what you've seen on the telly. We'll go to the holographic room. There's no need to make use of real warframes. We like Bauer, Seiyusen said. Okay. Hansen then turned around and asked Ji Yin and in Zero. Would you two like to wait here? Or would you like to come and watch? We'd love to go. Ji Yanren exclaimed, pulling Zero roughly by her arms. Everyone promptly went to the holographic room. The opponents took their positions. Xie Yusin winked to Bauer and said, If your father loses, you're ours. My daddy won't lose, Bauer said, emotionlessly. Her flat tone was almost creepy. Bauer, I would like you to remember this word. Professional. That's what I am. After that, Xie Yusin entered the holographic machine. 
Hansen then passed Bauer over to Ji Yaran. After that, he entered the holographic machine. After the two entered the battleground, the lobby displayed a screen for all spectators to watch. Go, Dad! Bauer shouted, in support of Hans Sr. Bauer then punched the palm of her other hand, proclaiming, When I win, all that candy will be mine. Everyone in the lobby had gathered around to watch. Then, another woman appeared there, wearing sunglasses. Shachin, why are you here? The woman looked shocked at seeing everyone there. A young man turned around then and asked, Why have you come here, sister? Hearing you shout Sheen call her sister, everyone turned to look at her. Is that your big sister? Is that our idol? Another young man asked. How many sisters do I have? Yu Shaoqing said, with a long roll of his eyes. Yu Yu Qian Qian? Everyone gasped in shock. The woman took off her sunglasses, revealing herself to be the ace operator that she was. Yu Shaoqing was a professional, but even he could not compete with the talents of Yu Qian Qian. What are you doing here? Yu Qian Qian asked. Yu Shaoqing explained what was going on, which prompted Yu Qian Qian to then ask, Why are you trying to hustle a random person? The little girl is too cute. We want to spend some time with her. We told her father we're from the WA, and yet he still agreed. Yu Xiaoqing pleaded in defense. Yu Qianxuan did not say anything more, as the match was about to begin. She was shocked, seeing Han Sen's warframe. SKTS? Who uses an old model like that in this day and age? I'm surprised that thing is not a rusted mound of bolts and scrap. Yu Xiaoqing wanted to laugh, but he noticed something and then went on to ask, Sister, didn't you advertise this model? Yes. It has been many years since then, Yu Qianxuan said. She had done many adverts for Super Warframes in the past, but the SKDS was the only model she had not operated herself. She sighed and then said, It is a shame this guy did not take a career as a Warframe operator. He'd be a legend. Yu Qianxuan seemed to take great interest in the fight that was about to unfold, and so she watched the screen intently. Xia Yusin recognized Han Sen's Warframe and identified it as the supremely outdated SKTS. This did not boost her confidence, though. She was humble enough to realize she had underestimated her opponent. But she herself was using a Sky Warrior, a model that was, for all intents and purposes, better than the SKTS. The SKTS did not have much in terms of weaponry and firepower, so even though its infrastructure was weaker and more fragile, it wasn't as if it made up for it with greater damage output. She wanted to showcase her agility, so she pulled out her laser sword and ran forward. Hansen had not operated a Warframe for a while, so he chose to use the old SKTS. After all, it was the model he was most comfortable with and knowledgeable about. Hansen moved around and got into the groove of its use again, despite acknowledging he was still quite rusty. Fortunately, Hansen had a high fitness. So, any bumps he took as he got comfy with the SKTS again were no big deal. Hansen laughed seeing his opponent come at him with a close-quarter combat weapon. It surprised even him that she did not seek to use ranged weaponry. If she was a real soldier, she wouldn't behave that way. The Warframes of the Alliance were mostly for show, so range was favored in almost every way. It was strange how she wished to showcase her talents and impress the audience through close-quarter combat. Chapter 1284 Real Professional Seeing the Sky Warrior Approach Hansen wasn't going to fall back or be intimidated. Eagerly, he thrust forward to meet with it, his own laser sword in hand. The SKDS lacked mobility in comparison to the opposition, however. The speed and thrusting capabilities were inferior to the model he was going up against, which put him at a disadvantage when it came to the needs for agility, and there'd be no way around that. Still, Hansen wasn't phased by this. At the end of the day, he firmly believed the victor was determined by the operator's skill. Everything boiled down to how well the operator controlled their machine in the thick of things, from the delicate ballet of movement to the timing of attack, and all the little things in between. It wasn't too far off battling without being inside such a machine. Hansen might not have been able to drive as well as Xie Yusin, and the lack of recent practice with warframes would usually result in a loss and the opponent being stronger. But Hansen had a higher fitness and a better level of judgment, and with that, he was going to even the odds. Siayusin was only an evolver, so her fitness wasn't even comparable. Of course, fitness was not the end-all, be-all of Warframe operation. His higher fitness level would help to close the gap, but he still needed to control his Warframe well. And that came down to raw, simple talent with the machines. 
Han Sen's skill with the Warframe was still a little rusty, though, so he knew he had to rely on his fitness and judgment to help even the odds. The audience were chatting a lot before the match, but when the fight began, they all fell silent. Weird. This guy looks sloppy, but then, why is Xie Yusin having a hard time defeating him? This should have been over real quick. Is she playing poorly on purpose? No way. The SKDS was inferior on all fronts, and it wasn't being operated as smoothly as it could have been. The audience was primarily composed of self-asserted professionals. They might not have been the best in existence, but they really were proficient and knowledgeable when it came to watching and using Warframes. They could all clearly see that Han Sen was a little rusty. But the Sky Warrior, despite all its bells and whistles, and the fact it was taking every advantage, seemed to be the one getting beaten back. It was a perplexing sight, and for all intents and purposes, it should not have been happening. Xie Yusin, on the field of play, was unsure of what was going on herself. Because Hansen hadn't used a Warframe in a long time, so he often made mistakes. Yet in a Warframe fight, a mistake could very well be fatal, and a killing strike could come before the operator even acknowledged the blunder they had made. Knowing and understanding the constant mistakes he was making, she felt as if she should have destroyed him several times over by now. But as time went on, she realized she couldn't. She wished to take advantage of every slip Hansen made, but whenever she tried to, she was unsuccessful. It was frustrating, and it was starting to get her flustered. She almost thought he had to be purposefully playing with her. When Hansen made a mistake, it almost seemed deliberate. He'd slip in a spot she didn't expect him to be, or he'd simply be too far away for her to reach. Some mistakes even enabled Hansen to dodge her attacks. This battle was starting to stress Xie Yusin out, as it was unlike anything she had ever had to deal with before. If she was to be beaten by someone who was much stronger, plain and simple, that would be fine. But this opponent was, for all accounts, supposed to be much weaker. And yet, no matter what she tried, she could not defeat him. She knew she could, and she knew she should have been able to, but she just couldn't. She kept on attacking not realizing she had been pushed into a corner. Hansen found himself having a lot of fun with his Warframe, and it took him back to his days in the military school. Am I getting old, thinking about the past? Nostalgia is the quotidian beast of aging, Hansen thought. Hansen was using Heavenly Go to dictate his movements. Hansen made many mistakes, but he was able to predict each move his opponent was going to make, which had his mistakes fall in spots where he would be fine. Hansen wished the fight would last longer, and he found it disappointing that he was so close to finishing her off. Xie Yusin kept on attacking without reprieve, unaware of where Hansen had led her. The audience, seeing everything, knew the Sky Warrior would be backed into a corner soon, and when that happened, her abilities would be severely limited. What's going on? Yu Xiaoqin asked. The professionals in the audience were not the best operators out there, and even they were perplexed by what had happened. Yu Qianxuan was in a league of her own, so if anyone could elucidate the bewildering proceedings, it'd be her. Yu Qianxuan helped to clear things up by saying, you have unwittingly tried to hustle an elite. No way. He makes too many mistakes to be considered an elite. If we made those mistakes, the coach would be yelling at us until he was blue in the face. Yu Xiaoqing didn't believe what he had been told. Others were of a similar opinion, not believing Han Sen was a pro. Yu Qianxuan went on to say, you might operate your warframes better than he does, but on a real battleground, this man would kill you. Are you pulling my leg? Is he really that good? The struggle to believe her was real. While they were talking, the Sky Warrior was pushed into a corner. And when she herself realized what had happened, it was too late for her to do anything. The SKDS struck her warframe, breaking it completely. Siayusin exited the holographic machine with red eyes. She was not afraid of losing but it felt as if she had been misled. The opponent was weak, and she had not at all anticipated such a defeat. She was an adult, though. Her eyes were very red, but she did not cry. Chapter 1285 Attacking Saint Fan Shelter Xie Yusin returned to Yu Xiaoqing's side and saw Yu Qianxuan beside him, also. She asked, Qianxuan? Yu Qianxuan stroked her head gently and told her, It's fine. There is no need for shame. You have merely encountered a genuine professional, that's all. Did he pretend to be a noob to trick me? Did he hustle me? Siayusin's sadness started to develop an undercurrent of frustration and anger. Not really, Yu Qianxuan said. 
She looked over to the holographic machine and then said, But let me give him a go. Yes, avenge my defeat, Su Xiaoqing proclaimed. There is no vengeance to be had, Yu Qianqiuan rebutted. But before she reached the machine, Hansen came strolling out as casually as he had first entered. Hansen? Yu Qianqiuan? When they crossed paths, they spoke each other's names in startled surprise. You two know each other? Su Xiaoqing asked. Su Qianqiuan said, don't tell me you don't know about humanity's first super aristocrat? The expressions of the two young ones now turned to shock, and they both squealed. This guy is the Hansen? Yu Qianqiuan said nothing more to them. Instead, she merely waved to Han San and spoke to him like the old friend he was. Long time, no see. You haven't changed a bit, Hansen said. Everyone was now fighting amongst each other to talk to Han San, and Xie Yusin's bitterness had turned to complete sweetness. She would have felt terrible losing the way she had to some commoner. But she was happy to let a superstar like Hansen pound her all day. Matching with a person like that, she felt she had been extremely fortuitous. Winning or losing did not concern her at all if she was going up against him. It was privilege enough to share the same air with him, she thought. Furthermore, she was still just an evolver. Hansen, on the other hand, had managed to take down an emperor's shelter in the third god's sanctuary. Yu Qianxuan then introduced her friends to Hansen, while he also introduced to them his wife, Ji Yan Ran, and his companion, Zero. Hansen felt very relaxed after that, and he had a good time in the company of his new acquaintances. Pressure was omnipresent back in the sanctuaries. This vacation came at the right time, he felt. It had really done him a lot of good, having a holiday like this, after the trials he had recently overcome. After the holiday was over, though, he decided to return to the sanctuary. Hansen, Super Body Super King Spirit Level Surpasser Lifespan 400 Evolution Requirement 100 Geno Points Own Geno Points 100 Ordinary Geno Points 100 Primitive Geno Points 100 Mutant Geno Points 100 Sacred Geno Points 93 Super Geno Points Hansen only needed 7 more points to completely max out. His fitness was 3,700, a staggering sum. When Hansen eventually reached demigod status, however, he'd do so at the number of 7,000. Hansen asked Drybone King about Saint Fan Shelter. Hansen had little silver, purple emperor, and now serpent throne for diligent companions, and he believed it would be enough to take on Saint Fan. Hansen actually had an advantage over the spirits. While he only lived once, he had no spirit stone. And having no spirit stone meant nothing worthwhile could be stolen while he was away. Even if Thunderhell Shelter was claimed by another force, in the time he would be gone, he could return and promptly reclaim it. Drybone King told Hansen everything he could about Saint Fan Emperor and his shelter. Hansen could paint a greater picture and imagine how well fortified the place would be, with the super creatures that protected it. It would be a fight more difficult than what had previously taken place on the plains. The primary problem with assaulting the place, though, would be securing the initial insertion point. Hansen could not walk right up to the shelter, as there was a broad, moat-like lake of holy water encircling it. To get across, he'd need, at the very least, the protection only Water Fairy could provide. Hansen approached her and asked if she also had the ability to bring Blue Dinosaur. Water Fairy answered his request by telling him, I can do that, but none of you will be able to do battle across the holy water. If Saint Fan attacks us as we cross, there will be nothing I can do to stop him. Is there another way we might be able to get in? Hansen asked, with a frown. Water Fairy suggested, you could always blow up the lake it sits at the center of. Blow up? The lake? Hansen paused for a minute, then rephrased her request to see if he understood. You mean to suggest we drain the water, or at least get it away, by blowing it up? Precisely. The holy water is a purified substance, it's not actually water. It conducts raw power. If we feed it enough power, and go beyond what it can naturally hold. We can blow it all up, Water Fairy said. I love this idea. Blowing things up never gets old. Hansen was keen on the idea, and so after hearing that, he hastily rallied his troops and set off on a march to St. Fan Shelter. The lake that encompassed the shelter was further encircled by a wide emerald expanse. Rodman hailed from East Crack Planet. He had been stuck at that shelter ever since he became a surpasser, and that was 70 years ago. 
The only thing he was allowed to do there was water the flowers every day. The holy flowers resided in the center of the shelter like a big parasol. They were like some shield generator, too, as they kept the holy water from penetrating the shelter. There were 200 humans there, suffering in the same conditions he was. Some had been there two years, whereas others had been there an entire century. Regardless of their circumstances, they were practically one and the same. Once they entered the shelter, they were completely robbed of their freedom. Rodman often thought about ending his own life, but he could never muster up the last bit of courage required for the act. Chapter 1286 Blowing Up the Lake All the humans, spirits, and creatures of the shelter were able to become a part of Saint Fan Emperor, reduced to a bulbous, fleshy mass whenever the wretched spirit desired the transformation. Many of the elder people considered committing suicide to avoid such a ghastly fate, but they knew that if they tried, Saint Fan would have them resurrected and forced to endure a punishment far greater than any that a grueling death could deal them. Rodman was more hopeless than ever, acknowledging the grisly doom that might inevitably await him. Mustering the strength to march on as a slave, each and every day, with a wicked news such as that above their heads was a monumental achievement, especially with the knowledge that not even the mercy of death could ever be obtained. For the human residents of St. Fan Shelter, hope was nothing more than a hazy memory of some ancient concept they were once familiar with. It was a distant stranger that never ventured there anymore. Like he did every other day, Rodman went to fetch water for the flowers. The waters might as well have been prison walls, and he wished for nothing more than to view the sky above with perfect clarity. Having to see the sky through the dreamy current of the water made it seem unreal. But then, all of a sudden, Rodman noticed the flicker of a foreign shadow. He could immediately tell it was a human, a young man, no less. He recognized this because the young man was wearing a battle suit that belonged to the Alliance. Rodman had seen something similar to this two years ago, and it wasn't exactly customary for spirits to don the garb of humans. But it was lovely to see, as it was a reminder of home. Has he come from another shelter? If he has, he needs to make himself scarce. If the spirits see him, he's going to have a bad time. As Rodman thought of this, more dark figures started to come into sight. He saw a shadow shaped like a big dinosaur, a spirit that looked like a skeleton, and many others. Rodman was disappointed by this, though, thinking the young man was probably a slave to the spirits that were accompanying him. Rodman wished it was one big bunch of humans he had seen perhaps that would restore some of the hope that had long since abandoned him. I think too much, same as always. What a fool I am, to think people can be free in this wretched realm. Ugh, I should have just stayed home and become a family man. Rodman almost laughed, but he knew it was a laugh brought on by the years of torture and slavery. He had been driven mad over the years, or so he felt. But just as he thought to disregard the shadows that seemed to be headed his way, the young man did something. The young man had turned to say something to the spirits and creatures that had come with him, and they seemed to diligently listen and do whatever it was they were instructed to do. Is this an illusion brought on by the spores of that latest funky flower? Rodman rubbed his eyes to make sure what he saw was legit. Why would spirits and creatures listen to the commands issued by a human? I really need to watch myself with those plants. They even gave me a rash last week, Rodman thought, realizing his vision was unimpaired. It was strange seeing the young man there, standing atop the lake. He wasn't quite sure what they were planning, but regardless, he had never seen anything like this transpire before. After a short while of discussion, the group split up. When Rodman watched what happened next, he slapped his own jaw in disbelief. Rodman had only seen super creatures and king spirits possess the power he was now witnessing. What are they doing, gathering up power like that? Rodman pondered. He had lived here for more than a few decades, and this was the first time he had ever seen anyone venture this close. Venturing near and causing trouble seemed like a fool's errand, but he had the sneaking suspicion they wouldn't be doing what they were if they didn't have a plan. A massive light erupted across the whole lake, and that was when Rodman noticed something. Boom. What he saw then was something he'd likely never forget. The lake water had been dyed with a strange color, and then it blew up. An explosion occurred and all the water of the lake went with it. Only faint raindrops followed after that. Rodman could now see the outside world fully. He could see the sky, rain, and grass again. And there, he saw the young man. It wasn't just a human with a pleasant face, it was a human with a pleasant face and confidence. 
It was a young man who looked happy and carefree, and not one who was miserable and hopeless. In St. Fan Shelter, sadness was the primary craft of human expression. A miserable thing. But alas, that was it. Okay, lads. It's time for an even greater display of your powers. Rodman heard the declaration the young man issued, and then the spirits and creatures rampage forward. Are they actually obeying this young man? Who in the sanctuaries is he? Rodman was frozen stiff, suspended by sheer disbelief. The next second, an angry voice sounded from the shelter. Who blew up my lake? St. Fan madly cried out. Human Emperor Hansen, you scrub. Rodman heard this and then thought, can humans truly rival emperors in strength? Is this the sort of stuff I've been missing out on during my years in this sordid armpit of the third god's sanctuary? But suddenly, Rodman lost all control of his body. He was pulled over towards Saint Fan. It wasn't just him, either. Every living thing was drawn towards the enraged spirit, from the creatures to the plants. Is this young man enough of a threat for Saint Fan to draw everything to him? Rodman wondered, but he believed it. And it was this belief that made him happy, even with the wretched circumstance that was about to befall him. Rodman was drawn to, and became a part of Saint Fan, and lost all control of his body. Whether it was a fortunate thing or not, though, his mind was still his own. He could see and mull over everything that was about to happen. Chapter 1287 Dirty Saint Fan When Hansen saw Saint Fan absorb every living being in the shelter, he was taken aback. He was going to grab the spirit stone while the silver fox kept it busy, but that didn't seem a likely possibility now. All right, we'll do this the old-fashioned way. Hansen drew Taya and his phoenix sword. The silver fox and purple emperor flew up high, ready to swoop. Serpent Throne had taken on the form of the chef, straight from Hell's Kitchen. She was ready to slice and dice whichever foe came her way, like Satan's personal butcher. Little Angel, Disloyal Knight, Xie Qing King, Dry Bone King, Qing Sun King, Thorn Queen, Blue Dinosaur, Metal Eater, and even Moment Queen now rushed forward like the Light Brigade. They were to be a merciless wave of death and destruction. Saint Fan had absorbed a ludicrous number of creatures, spirits, and other life forms, but against the wrath of three emperors, not even he was sure he could triumph. The tides had turned on him. The Silver Fox gathered up a large charge of lightning and tried to fry Saint Fan's body with it. Purple Emperor lopped off a large chunk of Saint Fan's fleshy, bulbous body. The strike was so clean, it could not regenerate. The chef's cleaver peeled fine slices of the spirit's wretched biomass off, like strips of beef, ready to be thrown into a hot pot. Hansen didn't do half as much as he was expected to, and he was more or less like an onlooker, observing Saint Fan's beating. But suddenly, Saint Fan's original form began to take shape. He spoke, stern and sullen, to say, Hansen, are you really going to kill me? You are already dead, Hansen said. Saint Fan laughed and proclaimed, Sure. You can kill me. That much is obvious by now. But by killing me, you doom the lives of all the others, too. Saint Fan gestured, and then a number of humans were revealed as being a part of the ugly, horrendous mush that formed the spirit's mutated body. Hansen frowned, never imaging Saint Fan would use humans. And he thought it even sicker that Saint Fan would use them as a negotiating chip. So, do you want this to continue? Killing me means killing them. Their blood will, I assure you, stain your hands. Can you really tolerate their deaths on your conscience? St. Fan said with a callous tone. St. Fan could read the minds of the humans he had absorbed, and he knew this hostage trick would work. It wouldn't work on spirits, but it most certainly worked on the humans. Hansen didn't relent. He frowned at the nagging of his conscience, but he still allowed the attack to continue. He had to kill St. Fan. There was no question there. For as long as he lived, the humans that joined his shelter were already as good as dead. But still, it hurt Hansen to even fathom having to be the direct result of a human's death. Rodman was surprised, more than anything. The human was such a threat to Saint Fan that the spirit had to use such a dirty trick. Rodman didn't think he could become any more disgusted with Saint Fan's behavior, and more than anything, he wanted the spirit to pay. With his now hideous, grotesque face, he managed to yell out, Kill him. Pay us no heed. The other humans also began to speak out with their pain distorted voices. It was like a chant, in which they urged Hansen to go forward with what he had planned to do and not look back. They wanted him to bring an end to Saint Fan. Yes, kill the pig. We have endured far too much as it is. 
Our lives, for the most part, have been good. We will thank you and send you our warmest wishes from the afterlife. Please, end our torment and slay this horrid spirit. Free us. Rodman and the others all told Han Sen to kill the spirit and not think about saving them. Saint Fan merely watched. Saint Fan had allowed them to speak this way. If he had wanted them silent, he would have shut them up. Saint Fan thought if they did this, it would lighten Han Sen's resolve to free them, rather than harden it. He thought it would give Han Sen cold feet, and he'd not proceed with what he had come to the shelter to do. Han Sen frowned. He acknowledged saving them would be impossible. Killing Saint Fan would result in the deaths of them all, but if the monstrous spirit wasn't killed, they'd all remain as slaves. It was impossible to get Saint Fan to free them, too. And Saint Fan knew that the humans were the best hope he had of survival at this point. Hansen thought Saint Fan's shelter couldn't be moved, but then the spirit absorbed the entire construct into him. If Saint Fan got away, carrying the shelter with him, Hansen might never find him again. Saint Fan did not know Hansen would come here with another two emperors, and neither did he expect Hansen to have so many troops with enough power to blow up the lake. As he mulled all this, his belief Han Sin would let him go began to wane. He wanted to get out of there before the attacks resumed. Kill him! Rodman exclaimed. Saint Fan smiled. Saint Fan's mind changed again, thinking now, after a long pause, Han Sin might not be able to do it. Han Sin was incredibly angry. He knew he could kill Saint Fan with ease, but he couldn't just kill the humans. Little Silver knew Han Sin was hesitating, and he knew the reasons why. If it wasn't for the humans, even the furry fox knew Saint Fan would be dead now. I am so sorry, guys. Hansen gritted his teeth, and after a deep breath, issued his final command. Take him down. His companions heard the order, and then moved in to attack. Saint Fan was shocked, and so then he took over the minds of the humans. Please save us. You murderer. You're actually going to do this. You were the chosen one. You were supposed to destroy the spirits, not humans. You were supposed to bring balance to the sanctuary, not leave it in darkness. I'm so young. I'm not ready to die. What about my wife and kids? You can't do this. Please, help me. I'm begging you, don't do this. The silver fox doubted the legitimacy of these cries. He suspected it was Saint Fan controlling their minds. But still, even little silver was feeling bad about moving in to fulfill the command he had been issued. Suddenly, though, a red beam hit St. Fan's eyebrow. Chapter 1288, Slashing Fan Everyone was shocked by what happened. Even St. Fan's face twitched as an expression of horrid surprise suddenly overcame him. Between his two eyebrows was a wound that bled. The emperor could regenerate broken tissue, so the small, phantom wound that had been inflicted should have been fine and nothing of much concern. But it bled profusely with no sign of recovery. And from the twitching muscles of his face, one could suspect Saint Fan was in some sort of agony. And with his utter silence and refusal to move, the entire scene was like a paused videotape, cliffhanging a big reveal. Suddenly, cracks began to form across the disheveled biomass. From afar, it looked like the ugliest face in the market had been broken, then put back together again with swathes of glue. Roar! Saint Fan roared to the skies above as his web looking body began to fall apart. Creatures, spirits, and humans all began to fall out of the mucus-laden mound of flesh. Somehow, they had been spared from the biomass and set free without damage to their bodies. Even the shelter and its holy flower had fallen out of the horrendous mass, seemingly without harm. St. Fan's forehead was cascading blood, and the fact that the wound was so small added to the creepiness of the scene. It was extremely unnerving. Blurk. St. Fan spat out some blood from his mouth now and a red light then flew out in Han Sen's direction. Saint Fan was on the precipice of being done, and when he teetered to the brink and plummeted off, he did so in the grisliest fashion possible. His body, and what remained of the biomass, exploded into a bloody, snotty mess across the region. The red light did not seem to venture towards the shelter, but all the same, Han Sen heard a spirit stone-like gem shatter. The sound was unmistakable. The humans were all in disbelief, rolling around trying to regain composure after what had just happened. And what's more, they felt the contracts binding them to St. Fan break. They looked around, stunned. The joy they sought to feel caught up to them through the days, and the spirits and creatures that had escaped the biomass with them tried to flee. Hansen commanded his companions to go after the super creatures. 
Then, he turned around to look at someone who had tagged along, unannounced. He turned to look at Zero. Zero's hair was a little purplish, but that color was on the retreat and had almost vanished. The humans moved forward to thank Han Senator. They saw the red light head in Han Sin's direction, and thus believed it was he who had unleashed that magnificent blow. He wasn't keen to correct them, though. And after the brief session of applause, Hansen raced over to the spirit hall. There, he saw a Saint Fan spirit stone in pieces. The humans all returned to the Alliance with much excitement. Some of them had been trapped inside the shelter for over a century, so they weren't even sure if their friends or family would still be there. They had a most strange mood as they returned home. All in all, Hansen's companions had managed to slay seven super creatures and six king spirits. Through doing this, they had obtained seven life geno essences and one beast soul. Hansen gladly accepted the spoils of war. Robin's return shook the alliance to its very core, as he announced that Hansen had taken down another emperor's shelter and saved 200 humans in the process. The humans were fine with giving their statements to the media and recounting their tale of what happened on the day they were saved. A documentary was made about it, and it was aptly titled, The First Human Emperor. Right now, Hansen was more interested in Zero, though. Hansen knew it was her who had killed Saint Fan, yet she accepted no fanfare and was not keen to even let others know it was her who had stepped in to save the day. Hansen remembered the red light, and he found it oddly reminiscent of the bone dagger she had once procured, under the strangest of conditions. That was fuel for his mind to wander and think. Hansen did not know if it was the bony knife itself or if it was the Azura Sutra's power that propelled the skill she had unleashed to resolve the situation. Zero, do you mind telling me how you killed Saint Fan? Hansen asked her in as gentle a tone of voice as he could fabricate. You taught me, Zero said. I did. Ah, you mean the Azura Sutra thing I once asked you to read? Hansen half asked her, thinking he knew what she meant, but wanting a confirmation off her all the same. Zero nodded, and then added the simple sentence, and the dagger. Hansen knew it had to be one of the two, but it seemed as if she didn't quite know which one, either. Hansen trusted Zero, but the Azura Sutra was incredibly powerful and so was she. It was almost frightening, but it looked like the curiosity that was Zero and the mystery surrounding her were still present. Answers might not be achieved that day, but the event had renewed Hansen's interest in who she was, that much was for sure. This was why Hansen never took to practicing the Falsified Sky Sutra amongst other reasons. It was weaker than the Dongshan Sutra, and not as pure as the Azura Sutra. But what concerned Hansen the most was the fact Zero had come along and attacked. Hansen could have killed Saint Fan, but the humans would have died along with the spirit. Hansen could think of only one possibility for how Zero had separated the spirit from the rest. He believed the Azura Sutra had a target select, where damage was only wrought upon those who the caster wished to deal damage. The Azura Sutra might have well been the only skill there that allowed for the killing of Saint Fan while saving the humans at the same time. That's the reason why God's Lair Luo is so famous. Ugh, I need to sort this out with Little Yin, and I need to become a demigod quickly, Hansen thought to himself. God Lair Luo was a famous demigod, one held in a regard that was high above all others. Chapter 1289 Life Door Opens Two years went by, and over the time, Hansen sent out Purple Emperor to take down a number of shelters to pave the realm for more common human occupation. While he had managed to take down many shelters of a lesser rank, he had also been able to take down three Emperor shelters. Han Sound had maxed out his Geno points and practiced enough to open nine Gene locks for the Dongshan Sutra and Jade's Gen. For some reason, no matter what he tried, he was unable to open his tenth. And his inability to do so, after so much time had elapsed, was rather frustrating. The same applied for the Blood Pulse Sutra, as well. That, the Dongxian Sutra, and Jade Skin were all stuck with nine gene locks open. Han Sun had almost managed to collect 1,000 geno points. Once he reached four digits, he theorized, he could unlock the elusive tenth gene locks that had escaped him. Of course, that was all just educated guesswork. But everyone needed a target or goal to aim for, and that was his for the meantime. But Hansen had been practicing life door consistently throughout the two years, as well, and he desperately wanted a breakthrough with it by this point. This was something else that was refusing to budge. Purple Emperor wanted more and more shelters to conquer and expand their influence and strength, but they soon moved as far as they could go. 
The human-occupied portion of the third god sanctuary they had managed to etch out was eventually bordered by mighty enemies not even they were able to overcome. It was a shame their expansion had come to an end, but Hansen valued the prospect that there were still greater challenges for him to overcome someday. Needless to say, over the course of those two years, Hansen had saved countless humans from the clutches of tyrannical spirits and made a name for himself far and wide across the sanctuary. To the spirits, he was an absolute menace of an emperor, and not a person looked on fondly. That, of course, was a result of him being a human, more than anything. And because of these deeds, new surpassers were able to spawn safely inside liberated shelters. The looming threat of doom after entering the sanctuary was no longer too strong, and evolvers were keener than ever to make the jump. Hansen was hailed as a hero, and rightly so. Knowing he had gone as far as he could go in terms of strength, Hansen decided it would be best to spend more time with his family. Going out with his family often, he found himself happier than he had been in a long time. Life was, for all intents and purposes, good. Hansen asked Uncle Bug how he might open life door, but he didn't receive an answer that helped. It took him 20 years to open it, and he was never sure what instigated the success, and he had no clue if there was an easier or better way to open it, either. Uncle Bug did say he taught his family life door though. And strangely, no matter how much they tried to master it, no one had been successful. So, even though Hansen continued his practice with it, he put it on the back burner most of the time. He wasn't going to focus on it 100%, and instead, he opted to spend more time with his family. Hansen, G. Yinran, and Bauer were currently playing. Bauer was on a swing, which Hansen merrily pushed. He suddenly froze, for some strange reason, despite having a blank mind that was not occupied with the thought of anything. Hansen stopped pushing the swing, which prompted Bauer to suddenly leap onto Hansen's back and ask, Dad, why are you ignoring me? Her voice was like an explosion, sounding directly in his eardrum. It made him shiver, but the shiver seemed to extend beyond a mere goosebump praising. He felt his life door open. All of a sudden, he felt revitalized. He felt as if he had been reborn anew. Hansen had no idea how his life door had opened. What are you laughing at? Ji Yinren asked, noticing his sudden burst of merriment and laughter. You guys are my lucky charms. Hansen kissed Bauer and kissed Ji Yin and with a thick smooch. It really was just as Uncle Bug said. How it unlocked, he had no idea. This was the strangest thing Hansen had ever taken the time to learn. But Hansen wasn't one to question his blessings. He was grateful for its opening, and that was it. He wasn't keen on learning the specifics. When life door finished, Hansen's body felt much better. Yes, but no standout change could be noticed. Hansen could feel the nine life kept pinned pulsate with a certain energy, though. It was different from the power he occasionally felt when practicing the Blood Pulse Sutra. Now, the nine life kept pinned felt like an actual creature, with its very own life force. It was just a pendant, so how or why it might have been alive confused Hans Sr. Hansen examined the pendant in closer detail, but he couldn't really learn anything new about it. And the technology available didn't elucidate anything for him, either. Hansen borrowed by Ishan's machine for the test. It was an inanimate object, as it should have been. Back in the sanctuary, just as Hansen was going to check out another shelter, he frowned as he noticed something else. Hansen felt a strong creature inside the shelter, and it wasn't one that belonged to him. The scariest thing was that it was lurking someplace near the spirit hall. This was Hansen's favorite shelter, so intruders weren't the sort of thing to bring a smile to his face. Thinking unwelcome guests had come to invade, Hansen's attitude quickly turned sour. Why are you hiding? Hansen called out as he looked at a pile of bones. Nothing responded, so Hansen threw his fist into the bones to see if something was inside. A light flashed away from his incoming punch to evade it. He was keen to throw another punch, but something stayed his hand. It was the voice of a female, and it said, I came all this way with an invitation, that is all. I came here to invite you to partake in the dining of holy baby fruit. Perhaps you are as brutish as the tales suggest, and had I known your behavior would be this wild, I wouldn't have come. Chapter 1290, Holy Baby Fruit Well, 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 look who it is. Empty witch? Why are you here? And if my eyes really aren't playing tricks on me, please tell me there's a good reason for your presence here. Last I recall, you weren't the fondest of company one could keep. Hansen was surprised, seeing the mini-lady. 
Back in the second god's sanctuary, the empty witch had used the empty vine to access the third god's sanctuary. That was the first and last time Hansen had met her, and it followed hot on the heels of a grueling adventure. The circumstances of their first encounter were not very pleasant, that was for sure. Empty Witch stuttered to say, Well, can I just be the first to congratulate you on your accomplishments? I can't believe you've managed to take down as many emperor shelters as the tales tell. Well, you're not the first. And for all you know, I just got a little lucky. I caught one emperor when he was napping, Hansen said. Empty Witch proceeded to tell him, If you think these attempts at a jest are charming, I can only admit that you are gravely mistaken. Hansen merely smiled and said, Jokes aside then, Come on, tell me why you're here. The holy baby fruit is going to ripen soon. Miss Lotus wants every emperor to try it. You may not be a spirit, but you're an emperor all the same. Because of this, she has extended you a very special invitation, Empty Witch explained. Then, after a brief pause, she jumped to ask, Where is the holy spirit? She's not here, Hansen plainly stated. Ji Yin Ren had joined an aircraft expedition, along with Bauer. Empty Witch looked disappointed but she moved forward to ask, can you bring her here? I would very much like to see her. Bauer is too busy to come right now. Anyway, keep explaining, Hansen said. That's disappointing. Ugh, I don't know why I came all this way. Empty which rolled her eyes. Hansen said, why is the Lotus Empress being so kind as to invite us all to eat this fruit? Holy baby fruit is an emperor-class geno plant. Only she can grow these, and every 10,000 years, she invites emperors from all across the sanctuary to taste them. It's your lucky day, it would seem, Empty Witch finished saying. Hansen did not say anything in response. It was a very strange proposition, one Hansen thought to be a little fishy. Plus, if he went, he'd be a sole human venturing into all spirit territory. It could have been a trap. Even if he was to consider going, he knew he'd have to take many precautions. Empty Witch could see the expression of doubt lurking behind Hans Sen's cold facade, and she tried to bring him ease by saying, Don't worry, there are many people there who despise each other. In the shadows of Evil Lotus Shelter, though, none would dare cause a scene. You'll be safe. Roger that. But... I think I'll pass, Hansen said. Hansen wasn't going to willingly place his life in the hands of others and take someone like her at her word. Normal Geno fruit no longer worked on Han Sen, and if Lotus Empress was willing to issue it out as a gift, he didn't think it could be anything all that special. I suspected you might look upon such an event with suspicion, and I'd wager that is because you don't know really know what this whole thing is. But don't worry, I have a sneaking suspicion of my own. A suspicion that suggests you will change your mind. Empty Witch then threw something to Han Sr. Han Sen examined the item and noticed it to be a lotus flower. This is her invitation. I suggest you ask your spirit buddies what holy baby fruit is. I'm sure you are more inclined to believe them than me. And once you change your mind, this is your ticket. Empty Witch paused, and then with bright and glittering eyes, jumped to say, bring the holy spirit, too. I still want to meet her. I'm off now to go visit another emperor and hand him his invitation. He's a grumpy fellow, but thankfully, they don't shoot the messengers. Anyway, Mr. Hansen. I implore that you take the time to ask around and think about it. Empty Witch then swiftly flew away. Hansen frowned. Empty Witch was able to sneak inside the shelter without being detected. She was good. Becoming this strong in such a short time meant Lotus Empress must have been quite something. Empty Witch didn't seem particularly special, yet her Empress had trained her extremely well. Hansen asked his companions about holy baby fruit and whether or not Lotus Empress could be trusted. This event had been going on for a long time, and it was confirmed to be safe. No deaths or dangers had ever been reported as occurring there before, either. Every holy baby fruit bestowed upon someone gave them one self-geno point. And emperors had actually received two at the last event. And one holy baby fruit, out of all the ones to be given out, possessed a holy baby inside. If you were lucky enough to receive that one, you could open a gene lock. If you had already opened ten gene locks, you could open the door and become a demigod. 40,000 years ago, an emperor ate the holy baby and immediately became a demigod. There were 3,000 fruits up for grabs, though. Getting the right one was sheer luck. Why doesn't she eat the fruit herself? Then, Hansen found it too good to be true. Hansen thought only a crazy fool would hand out such wondrous gifts willy-nilly. Dry Bone King, 
the source of Han Sin's information, explained, the legends say it is because she is unable to eat them. Instead of letting them go to waste, though, she charitably hands them out. Pretty much every emperor has tasted her fruit, and it kind of means they owe her one in return. It's a way for her to earn respect more than anything. If spirits want more fruit, they must maintain their pleasantness with her. That's interesting, Hansen thought. Maybe Ghost told Hansen. Some berserk super creatures receive invitations, too. And while you hold that invitation of hers, you won't be provoked when you're out and about. Unless you go looking for a fight and start one, of course.